When it comes to both Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire, Ned Stark is largely seen as the standard bearer of all things good, honest, and true in Westeros. And it's impossible to deny that yes, in comparison to the vast majority of other men who have found themselves in the positions of power that Ned occupied, he was genuinely kinder and tried to do better by the common people than almost all of them. The societal structure of Westeros has injustice built into its foundations. But in an unfair world, Ned largely represents everything that the ideal ruler in this rigged system should aspire to be. Ned embodied the ideals of Westeros so steadfastly and so notoriously that he became the kind of man who other men would risk their lives to defend even after he was dead which is a distinction that hardly any other character in the history of Westeros can claim. He is undoubtedly a good man with a good heart, which in certain ways can get him far in the incredibly brutal world that he existed in. However, the fact that he was a good man in a largely terrible world does not necessarily make him a hero. And ultimately, his commitment to his principles, regardless of the circumstance, means that in a few extremely vital instances, Ned Stark's unimpeachable honor actually made him more of a villain than a hero. It comes as a huge surprise, given how heroically Ned is presented on the surface of his characterization. But one of the most consistent subtextual themes of his character throughout A Game of Thrones is actually injustice committed against the innocent. Within the world of Ice and Fire, duty and justice can often come into conflict with one another. And unfortunately, when Ned is confronted with situations that are complex or present him with some kind of internal or external struggle, he will take the path of least resistance instead of doing what is objectively right. There are a few vital, game-changing situations in which Ned did what he was told rather than what he knew he should. And... Arguably the clearest and most memorable instance of Ned doing the wrong thing in the name of misguided duty is when he killed Lady at Cersei and Robert's command. The entire event in Derry is an incredibly important and interesting one, because this one incident really exposes the power dynamics that are at play with a huge number of the characters. But what's interesting is that Ned seems to be, at best, unaware of his position of power and at worst, unwilling to use it in defense of his completely innocent daughter and her innocent pet. Obviously, the world of Westeros is not the same as the real world. However, George R. R. Martin seems to be telling the audience a lot about Ned with this event. It's not hard to imagine how it would feel if one of your own parents murdered your beloved companion just because someone else told him to. But what makes the entire interaction even more disturbing is that on some level, Ned undoubtedly knows that he could find another way to handle things if he actually tried. The adults in this scenario are largely acting out their own rivalries and using their children as pawns to express themselves in this instance. So Ned's decision to kill Lady rather than seeking another solution almost feels like he's doing it just to prove something to Robert and especially to Cersei. And that consideration for what this will do to Sansa isn't actually much of a factor. So instead of just waiting another few hours to approach the situation again, or simply letting Lady go and telling everyone that he'd killed her, Ned immediately kills Sansa's gentle and trusting direwolf with barely even a moment's hesitation. A hasty decision that ironically has a massive narrative consequence for both Ned and Sansa in the future. Many fans like to put a lot of responsibility for Ned's death onto Sansa, which is somewhat unfair, both because she's a child who doesn't understand the magnitude of what's at stake, and because her influence over what happened, at least in the book narrative, doesn't seem to be that great. Ultimately, there are quite a few indications that the Lannisters have plans in place to keep Ned there before Sansa ever even goes to Cersei. But one of the biggest overlooked reasons why Sansa shouldn't be blamed is that essentially, she did exactly what Ned told her to. The loss of Lady is painful and seemingly eternal. 
Sansa continues to miss and reminisce about her dead direwolf for the entire series thus far. And it's not hard to imagine why. Given that, in a magical sense, she and Lady were essentially meant to share a body and soul. But despite that connection, despite the fact that Sansa and Lady both did nothing wrong, the man that Sansa expects to be righteous and honorable, above all else, doesn't even raise his voice in defense of saving Lady's life. Cersei puts forth Lady as a potential sacrifice, and Ned doesn't hesitate to kill her. In a metaphorical sense, Ned doesn't hesitate to kill a huge part of Sansa just because the king and queen told him to. And within that context, it seems incredibly easy to see why this backfired on him massively. The impact of Lady's death has multiple facets to it. The first and most obvious is that it isolates Sansa and makes her mistrustful of her father. It also isolates Ned because he doesn't want to confront the terrible thing he did to his daughter. So he distances himself from her at the worst possible time in the broader narrative. But the key dimension that makes this so bad is that Ned demonstrates to Sansa that the royal family takes precedence over their own. That the king and queen's wishes, no matter how senseless or cruel, are more important than anything else, even protecting each other. Ned explains almost nothing to Sansa throughout a Game of Thrones, even in incredibly important life-or-death situations. But based on his actions, it's completely logical that Sansa would defer to Cersei over Ned. Of course that's what would happen, because that is exactly what Ned did when he killed Lady. If her unimpeachable and dutiful father will follow the commands of someone like Cersei, even to the point that it traumatizes Sansa and kills something innocent, then logic would clearly dictate that Sansa should behave just as he did. And from her point of view, given that she knows nothing about the threat that the Lannisters pose, the stakes are actually much lower when Ned wants to leave King's Landing than they were when Lady was to be killed. Another interesting injustice that's more nuanced, hidden, and difficult to confront is the immoral way in which Ned essentially punished Theon Greyjoy. George R.R. Martin crafts this narrative pretty masterfully, because it's easy to overlook the fact that Theon has been treated incredibly unfairly by Ned Stark, because Ned is so appealing and Theon is so unappealing. But the audience meets Theon years after he was initially taken from his family and traumatized. So it'd be absurd to expect that this experience didn't completely form his personality and likely have a hugely negative impact on who he became. It's also interesting because although Ned clearly treated Theon better than some would treat their hostages, he is still a hostage. He was essentially abducted as a young boy and taken as a tacit threat to Balon Greyjoy. And although it's difficult to imagine Ned doing anything unforgivable to Theon for his father's transgressions, Ned's commitment to honor has demonstrably led him to do objectively terrible things already. Theon ultimately acknowledges this potential danger, and directly cites it as a justification for his conquest of Winterfell. So, even giving Ned the benefit of the doubt, and presuming he never would have done anything bad to Theon at Robert's command, he certainly didn't do enough to convince Theon that he was safe in Winterfell. There's also an interesting and obvious foil dynamic between Theon and Sansa. Sansa is treated abhorrently by Joffrey, but Cersei sees her relationship with Sansa as something surprisingly deep, at least in terms of someone as emotionally absent as Cersei. She feels so certainly that she has treated Sansa better than she deserves, that Cersei even takes offense to the fact that she allowed Sansa to become part of her household, and that Sansa, at least in Cersei's mind, betrayed her. And although the horrific treatment at Joffrey's hands is a huge deal, if that's taken from the equation, then Sansa's life in King's Landing doesn't seem very far removed from Theon's life in Winterfell. And even more interestingly, because Theon does so much awful shit and the Starks are so clearly coded as heroic, the audience themselves largely projects the Cersei-esque reaction onto Theon's behaviors. 
both within the story and outside of it, people seem to think that Theon should be grateful that the Starks were such kind captors to him. When in reality, Ned is the villain at the start of Theon's story that the audience simply never got to see. It's fascinating that George R.R. R. Martin intentionally built this into the foundation of Ned Stark's characterization that's established before the story even starts. Because it plays a nice bit of trickery on the audience and essentially gives them an out to ignore the fact that Ned has taken a child hostage with the expectation that one day the tacit threat towards Theon may have some very real ramifications. But again, this injustice that Ned commits against Theon obviously has massive and far-reaching consequences for the entire Stark family and the entire North. Clearly, what Theon does in Winterfell is terrible, but it's a great example of the fact that permitting injustice almost always leads to even greater injustice. However, one great instance of the way in which Ned Stark uses his honor as a shield to do something that's objectively and horrifically wrong is a situation that a lot of people tend to overlook, but that I actually think is the best insight into the fact that Ned isn't the hero that most people believe him to be. And that is the execution of Garrod at the start of the story. In Game of Thrones, the Night's Watchmen Will and Garrod are swapped out for each other, which I actually think is an enormous mistake. As the characterization of Garrod and using Garrod's execution as a means of introducing Ned Stark to the audience must be incredibly intentional. Although the person that Ned executes in the TV series is a younger man, Garrod is an old and extremely experienced man of the Night's Watch. He's been at the Wall for 40 years and served dutifully the entire time. Although Ned can't make a lot of sense out of what he's saying, and he seems to feel some pity for this man who appears to be struck by madness, he pushes away these giant flashing warning signs that something is very wrong and executes him for the crime of desertion anyway. Ned starts off the story by killing someone because honor and duty demand that he do that. But that duty conflicts with what is very obviously right. Garrod is convicted of a crime that he did commit, but that was completely out of his character. And rather than questioning what Garrod was saying, or even questioning whether or not it's acceptable to kill someone who seems to have lost their minds and may not have even intentionally done the wrong thing, Ned kills him and writes off his terror as the crisis of a madman. And although Ned's disbelief is understandable, and he's clearly not to blame for the others potentially destroying Westeros, if he had been as curious about Garrod as he was about John Aaron, then the world, or at least the North, could have had much more time to prepare for an existential threat that will likely kill thousands. But what makes Garrod so interesting is that he largely begins the story in the exact same way that Ned ends it in A Game of Thrones. Garrod says something that sounds too absurd to be believed. He acts out against the establishment that he's supposed to follow. And then he's unjustly executed because those are the rules, and everyone just follows them instead of questioning why such a reliable and even-keeled person suddenly broke them. This is essentially exactly what happens to Ned when he's convicted on false charges of treason. And this cannot be a coincidence. Although A Song of Ice and Fire is clearly meant to focus mainly on the nobility of Westeros, George R.R. R. Martin clearly never wants the audience to lose sight of the fact that every person matters, and anyone from the highest lord to the lowest of the common people can change the course of history. And Ned Stark is undeniably one of the kindest and most benevolent people in the story. But that doesn't mean that he's a hero, and that doesn't mean that he's above reproach. Many mistakes contributed to Ned's ultimate downfall. Many of those mistakes were Ned doing the objectively wrong thing. And in many instances, Ned was using his honor as a shield to protect himself from making the most difficult choices, even when they were the right ones. One of the most consistent themes in A Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire is that there are always narrative consequences for decisions, even if those decisions don't seem relevant at the time. Ned Stark didn't deserve to die in the way that he did. 
but neither did the man that Ned executed at the beginning of the story. And although Ned is one of the best men in the series, he was never meant to be its infallible, tragic hero. But what do you think? Is Ned the embodiment of the Westerosi ideals? Or did he pay a high price for his bad choices? Leave your comments and opinions below. And if you're interested in more content like this, like and subscribe.